it's gonna be die. Gloria Victus, or Fame of the Victory in Latin. The name implies its major feature, epic RVR inspired by Dark Age of Camelot. It's a low fantasy medieval MMO RPG with an exceptional soundtrack and immersive atmosphere. However, remember the woman in the red dress scene in the original Matrix? The setup for that expose in the movie was done through compelling world building. They constructed a social context full of expectation and suddenly broke the fantasy by the introduction of the woman. Now, Gloria Victus shouldn't have their Matrix broken, but by its own design, unfortunately, it has many agents who instead of assaulting Neo, they attack your immersion. Red dresses aside, there is much to love about this MMORPG, so let's see if it's any fun. The splash screen is impressive and hopefully is representative of gameplay. Settings are robust and there is a medic mode for the party interface. I'm not sure what it does, but you can do it. There's an awesome soundtrack by the composer of The Witcher 3 and thus great starting vibes. NA slash SA servers preferred, so sorry if you do not live in that area. However, I do live in the USA, so I'm picking NA. Character creation is reasonably complete. Three nations have visually distinct armors. There are various origins, yet it's difficult to tell how meaningful each is beyond lore fluff. Gloria Victus provides buffs to the underdog to encourage more players to add to their population. In this case, it's the Sangmar people. I want to look like a Viking, so I pick a Steerborg of Ismir. I appreciate the historically landed terminology, which hints that there may be enjoyable world building and lore. The appearance options are simple, yet effective. Sorry guys, no boob slider here. However, I appreciate the grimmier, darker tone of the game as it emphasizes, even here, that it's less about hypersexualization and more about grounded realism. In fact, there's no magic at all. So, so far, there's consistency. I like that. Like in some other sandbox MMOs, you can fill out a quick Q&A for the game to make skill slash attribute choices for you. But since you have no idea what's important or useful at this point, I ultimately decide to try manually selecting archers. As you pick through your archetypes, the game previews some weapon-specific animations. You can tell that much effort went into these. In fact, Jacob, who animated Gears of War and Witcher 3, was involved. The attention to detail is impressive. If you've ever shot a bow right-handedly, you know that the arrow must be on the left side. That's reflected here. But if you're holding a one-handed weapon, you don't curl your other hand to make a C-shape. But they've done it here to obviously avoid unique animations. I get it, doing so is cost-effective, yet you're telling me simultaneously that you both care and don't care about the quality of your animations. Just pick one and be consistent, because any little disparity between realism and cutty corners is working against the effort to have high-quality animations to begin with. So while most animations are impressively clean, some aspects of them are also awkward and junky. This conflux of excellence and corner cutting, unfortunately, doesn't stop here. As I'm about to enter the game world, I learned that you can switch nations, but to do so, you have to spend a nation change point. I don't know how I got mine, yet I don't want to spend it, since maybe I'll need it later. I personally dislike MMOs giving me currencies that I didn't earn via gameplay because I have no idea the cost associated with them. Are they associated with the cash shop? Could you redeem or transfer them into other currencies later? The game doesn't tell me here, so I keep on my way. So far, I'm excited. The soundtrack is compelling, the graphics are reasonably well-tuned and realistically saturated. The sandboxy approach to character creation is ticking all the right boxes. While I've been a supporter since before they were greenlit, yep, remember those days? It's been years since I've last played Gloria Victus, so I'm looking forward to getting into Realm vs. Realm, deep crafting, and town management. It's in the loading screen that my hope for consistency is being threatened. The loading text breaks my immersion by discussing the program. Why not take EverQuest's approach and translate these warnings into game-friendly lore, since world building has been seemingly important thus far? I'm currently getting mixed signals. However, I get a note about upgrading fortifications during the load screen, so I'm hopeful that as a newbie, they'll teach me the basics of the game's famed Realm vs. Realm system. 
out of the loading screen, I notice that the town I'm in is not Stoneholm, but merely. But the images being rendered during the loading screen kept describing Stoneholm. That's confusing, because you're painting an expectation to the player about what they soon will experience. While the concept art is beautiful, it's also jarring. I'd prefer images of the locations I'll be in soon to conceptually prepare myself. But I'll forgive this minor short-sighted decision, because the game's about massive PvP battles, right? Upon loading in, you are flooded with information from several sources. I can immediately tell there are many interacting and overlapping systems, and all appear to be turned on from level 1. There are two separate tutorials immediately demanding your attention. While one has an admittedly helpful GIF, it doesn't show me how to transition to cursor mode. It just shows someone moving their cursor, but I can't move mine. The other tutorial is about food. Its location is critical, and you'll see why in a moment. I click all the buttons on my keyboard to hopefully stumble upon activating cursor mode. But before I'm successful, I hit the button Z and open up the character advancement window. Its translation is curious, as you have to unblock nodes to access them, or you can convert them to free experience. I have no idea what the conversion to free experience entails, and so I ignore that system for now and carry on. At this point, I learn that since I selected the character development window, I'm now in cursor mode, so I push the minus toggle on the tutorial to remove it. Because I had yet to complete that tutorial, it adds a properly highlighted question mark on your UI to trigger it again. I like that. I can easily access the tutorial again if I felt the need to refresh my memory. It's also highlighted in such a way as to make it easy to discern where it is, assuming I can access my cursor again. Good design. The first tutorial about food is still on my screen. I haven't yet figured out how to access cursor mode independent from the character advancement screen, so I push escape, yet that key brings up the menu, so the food window will remain visible until later. Graphically, at this point, the game is impressive. Serious Skyrim vibes. I want to explore every nook and cranny of this location, so hopefully the game empowers me to do so. Sheets of snow precipitate from the stormy sky. I can hear the blacksmith working in the town beneath, and the conversations of the NPCs, while not distinct, are audible. Footsteps rattle chainmail hosted by the torso of its walking warrior. This area feels like a Nordic medieval town. Hopefully they can keep up the ambience, because this right here is perfect. I love it. I hope the whole game feels like this moment. The soundscape is impressive too, and is signal that the development has what it takes to make an excellent MMORPG. The music is stunning, which is no surprise because Marcion, the composer for Witcher 3, scored it, along with Sophia writing additional tracks. Sharp strings, percussive drums, emotive horns, and rattling vocal layers send shivers down my spine, building anticipation for the looming epic war to be had. A guard walks by and says, it's going to be a beautiful day. Yet its white text doesn't have any drop shadows, making it nearly impossible to read against a white background. This is another small detail that should be extremely easy to fix. What's bizarre is that there is a drop shadow over the text when you're about to interact with an object. Since they use Unity, they could simply use USS Unity's Style Sheets feature to remedy this usability problem. Impressively, you can actually deny quests. Quest objectives have an easily visible icon on your screen so you know exactly where to go. Excellent. At this point, I realize that there is a scroll with two notices on the bottom right of my screen, but since I haven't figured out how to access cursor mode independent of triggering character advancement, those will have to wait too. Guild recruitment happens via an in-game interaction. Great! Upon interacting, I learned that I can now use my cursor again, so I close the eating tutorial and examine the two notices on the bottom right hand of my screen. One is an advertisement for their other game, and the second is for login rewards that they label reward for daily activity, about which I've published elsewhere. There are lists of other reward categories similar to Lord of the Ring Online's deeds that reward players for activities that are likely to already do in the normal course of gameplay. It was when I was examining the recruiters board that I learned that there are dungeons and raids. I thought this was an RVR PvP title. Interesting. Maybe I'll stumble upon one. 
like the character advancement window, I'm now in cursor mode. I could see a third tutorial underneath them all, which is now quite helpful. I can access the cursor by hitting Alt Left. But why hide this critically important information under another tutorial? But at least now I know. I also take this opportunity to look at the seven buffs for some reason my character has, one of which is Legend. I take issue with this name because my character, obviously, is not legendary. I just started. This signals to me that there may be more fundamental storytelling issues if someone fresh out of character creation is a fabled hero. Moreover, I have another buff that says newcomer, so how am I a legendary newcomer? With that said, the other buffs make some sense, but I still wish that the game gave them to me after I engaged in some relevant gameplay because I have no context for any of them. You're buffed based off of newbies and your fed status in addition to the performance of your nation in Realm vs. Realm. If you've ever played Guild Wars 2, then this system of bonuses will be familiar. In short, how well your side fares in PvP will result in various PvE bonuses. Presumably, the overlay text for one of the buffs became stuck, telling me that the last visited location was hyphen, hyphen, hyphen. And for some reason, upon leaving the town, my HP bars are rendered. I guess it's normal to have over 600 HP at level 1. However, I return briefly to town to test the UI and walk back out, and the HP bars do not render. I'm not sure if this is a bug or by design, yet it's still confusing. Hmm. The first quest requires that I slay Midlandic scouts, yet the ones before me are Raubritters. Maybe they belong to the Midlandic nation? Regarding animation design, I actually appreciate the detail that when you need to reload, your character actually draws from their hip equipped quiver. I turn to first person mode to see if it changes the experience at all, but. As I'm evaluating my experience, one of the combatants moments away from certain death begins to gossip about some guy named Henry, presumably a local townsman. I suppose that their melee is so disinteresting that it's more enjoyable to fence with words than with swords. After helping slay the mobs, it wasn't clear if I had bonus damage from attacking at the rear or if there is a headshot feature. Apparently, arrows have to reload magically, like mana. Additionally, holding down a shot doesn't take any more stamina to shoot than a basic shot, just more of your time, although presumably it gains a damage multiplier. Unloading an entire quiver of arrows only reduces your stamina to half, and after waiting for about a second it restores back to full, so there seems to be very little choice or downside to spamming arrows, assuming you can maintain your advantage while depleted. For a game that boasts realism, this system feels a bit strange and more akin to magic than it does archery. Either way, I have to wait for them to reappear one by one, so I do. But due to a low amount of regenerated arrows, I equip my axe and enter melee to defend myself from a charging bandit. Animations feel fluid, sound quality is superb and crunchy, although quite loud, since the mobs are quite easy to defeat and pose very little threat, I feel like the advertised combat system influenced by Mountain Blade is missing an opportunity, but perhaps when in PvP, the system shines. I know, I know, I didn't assign my attribute points like you MMO pros because too much is going on right now. For example, so much text is being displayed that I couldn't read it all even if it were legible. Which, by the way, did anyone playtest the reception of these micro stories? I want to believe that they add substance to the world, yet I doubt any normal reader can parse them in time. Regardless, at this point I should explain how combat works. If you've ever played Mountain Blade, then you're already fluent. There are four directional attacks, each triggered by where your cursor is when you click your attack mouse button. If your opponent is also blocking in that direction, then you deal no damage. There's a power bar, yet it's difficult to know how influential it is since I kill mobs in about two hits anyways. The pace is fast and frantic, which I like. However, none of the mobs are presenting any real threat or danger, so it's hard to tell how tactically significant any of these choices really are. I'm doing just fine, not worrying about their block direction, and swinging away enjoying the lucid animations. Because the audio from Malay is too loud, I turned the sound effects volume down, but it takes all sound effects volume down. 
Since I love the ambient noise, I decided to split the difference, yet I really wish they separated weather slash ambient versus combat sound effects. It is here that I'm signaled to pay attention. I'm instructed to retrieve stolen supplies. When I run near to the supply crates, it tells me to push E to gather resources. I find that this tooltip is unusually vague, yet accurate enough to describe the action I'm about to take. But remember the text example now because it comes up again later. After pushing E and waiting, my character demolishes one set of crates, but then the second simply disappears. Gone. Poof. I'm not sure where it went, but nonetheless I completed the quest. I also found an out of place chest. Even though my immersion at this point was suffering, I looted it anyway. I wander to the hearth, which is really just a fireplace, which opens up a crafting menu. I see that I'm already level 15 in weapon forging despite never having crafted an item, and there are red, green, or gray dots next to certain recipes. I have no idea what any of this means at this point, yet I figure that I'll learn it later. I hope that this is not the crafting tutorial. Now, why was this bandit camp right outside of the main city? And why couldn't this bare pelt wielding man take care of it himself? This issue becomes more apparent later, yet I'm starting to lose my sense of groundedness in the game world. I realized the need to establish enmity between different factions early in the experience to teach players basic combat skills and to parse equipment descriptions. Yet there are better ways to do it without damaging the sense of realism you've sought so hard to establish in the first place. Also, as you meander down to the bridge, you may notice that the gorgeous weather effects stop at a certain point on the y-axis. Also, the water movement doesn't look quite right. It's clearly a plane that intersects with the geography with all the water moving in one direction. Water doesn't move like that, and if you're trying to sell a realistic game set in a believable world, the water needs to be at least reflecting remotely accurate behavior. While there is so much to love, with the incredible passion evidently invested into Gloria Victus, there are are also as many little details that threaten to shatter the fantasy of this dim, dark world. I don't mean to be pedantic here or overly critical. I am simply giving my honest and transparent thoughts about my experience in the MMORPG. Please remember that the developers themselves have asked for feedback, and I'm doing just that, both the good and areas for improvement. Upon crossing the bridge, when I pushed the letter I, due to the lighting in this scene, my character's hair becomes gray, not brown. Why didn't they use the same light they did during character creation, and why does it look like my character is holding invisible cucumbers? After assigning my attribute points in both constitution and dexterity, the game reminded me to open the abilities window by showing me how. Thank you. But also, why not tell me the hotkey to do that as well? Here another system was introduced. Abilities are different than character development. The ability system is flexible and visually suggests that you can functionally cross-class as you branch into various nodes. It's simple and effective. However, with the Marksman node, it modifies quite a few components of your build, including granting a knife attack. But I don't want a knife attack, since I prefer fighting at range, so I invest in the horsebound ability despite not even owning a horse. I figure that I'll earn one soon enough since I can allot points into this node this early in the game. Next, I am instructed to gather resources. I turn to the left and see a felled tree. I imagine this is a harvesting tutorial, but nope, just a fetch quest. I try to chop it into pieces using an axe, yet all it wants me to do is hold the E button. It's the same push E to gather resources helper text that's presented, but it's surprisingly accurate here. I need the firewood to light a signal that looks more like a fledgling bonfire, yet you can look back and admire the fantastic world design. The wind pushes and pulls the falling blankets of snow, the sheets of freezing precipitation blur the distant hills, and smoke rises from the chimneys and merely. I interact with the merchant and learn quite a few things. You can move around the UI windows, which I like. Each weapon has directional stats, and some can double as gathering tools. New items have a yellow circle around them that fades upon hover. Also, a very pleasant song caresses my ears in the background. Here's a sample.
I also remembered that I received a light armor helmet from the quest before, yet because I hate how it looks, I take it off. I can't tell if there's a vanity system yet or a hide helmet option. Merchant NPCs just stand around, which is dissonant from the newbie town I was just in. And if this is supposed to be a staging ground for military advancements, then why aren't the NPCs practicing their archery or melee abilities? There's just this guard servant sitting down and this guy named Hirfin. No idea how to pronounce that. But the bigger point is that this feels like a missed opportunity to hammer down their world building. I'm supposed to ring a bell, and this is where the interactive text started to show its limitations. While it categorically worked to refer to resources and was technically accurate regarding picking up a tree, ringing a bell is not gathering resources. Obviously, this text is rendered anytime anyone interacts with a quest object that isn't killable. This is another minor imperfection that is beginning to add up. So far, there are no large issues, no game-breaking bugs, just repeated corners being cut that suddenly take you out of the experience, like the woman in the red dress. The bell triggered an event. Cool. But as I engage, there's no way to tell who's friend or foe. As swords are flying and arrows darting, the NPCs begin to gossip again. It seems clear that there are auto timers associated with dialogue whether or not they're in combat. What's too bad about the system is that it's clear there are meaningful stories about locations and people within the game world, yet their delivery is random and entirely disconnected from the relevance to the player. So while a guard is talking about some guy named Brandon, I just begin shooting. I learn that there is a headshot mechanic, which makes range gameplay conceptually viable, yet the chances of landing one, especially if your target is moving, is slim. However, hitting things is more fun than shooting arrows, so I equip my polearm and enter the fray. As I charge, a guard quips, it's going to be a beautiful day. Nostalgic. Upon engaging in melee, a combat tutorial begins and I'm too focused to pay attention. It's annoyingly taking up about 10% of my total screen space. Moreover, I notice that ally renders if I hit a non-enemy, but I wish the game did a better job telling me this before my weighted axe cuts into my viking comrade. The AI is very basic, and I won by aimlessly swinging my axe. While in town, I learned that cursor mode is only active while pushing left alt. It doesn't enter the user into a new UI state. I prefer Black Desert Online's or Guild Wars 2 solution to transitioning from an aiming reticle to a cursor. In the camp, I decide to finish the combat tutorial. It's here that I demonstrate some of the clunkiness of the animation system. Each animation on its own is believable. However, transitioning to each one, especially pulling a weapon from your back or putting it back, is jarring. In particular, the axe begins far too high on your character's shoulders and distracts me from what is great about the animation. It feels like another corner cut. Blocking feels odd with a knife, yet with other weapons is pleasant to view. I'm particularly impressed by the change of foot stance when wielding an axe when you change the blocking direction. The aspiring attention to detail is now a pain point because the presence of cut corners is diminishing from what is superbly excellent about Glory Victus. I finished the quest and level up, but since it doesn't seem to matter at this point, I don't even distribute my attribute points. When I enter the camp, tents are resources, and I'm given the same interaction text. And why is there a rebellion right next to the army's camp? I'm beginning to see a pattern. When I complete the quest, I'm given a bag, but to use the bag, I have to pay crowns. While crowns are the game's currency, it felt odd that I didn't pay a merchant for the transaction. Or why is it even necessary to be taxed to wear a bag? I understand the need for gold sinks, yet this implementation felt confusing. But at least there is modified visual progression. Now, at this time, I'm thinking about combat. Offense is more tactically beneficial than blocking at this point. But why am I dealing 200 damage at level 7? And is 400 experience a lot to earn per kill? The game is throwing numbers at me, yet it's difficult to get a sense of how significant they are. Yet in my attempts to see my character panel, I force myself into first person mode. I will have to wait to figure out how to reset my perspective. I run across the bridge and try to gather some wheat. Nothing. I enter the large building. I talk to Iroh and was absolutely delighted to see an avatar reference. Unfortunately, nothing about this Iroh reminded me of the tea brewer of Jasmine Dragon. I am instructed to gather hops, so I figure this is the time for a crafting tutorial, but no, I now have to interact with the wheat I couldn't just moments before. Opportunity squandered.
While examining a corpse, the game again tells me that the resource is in use. I feel like this notice can go away entirely, and it would only improve the experience. I loot some animal parts that I presume are for crafting that the game hasn't even mentioned yet, and I walk into the town. The ambience is superb. Snow falling, light flickering from the constellation of scattered fires and the windmill turning by the waves of wind pushing, snow flurries across the countryside augmented by a chilling soundtrack. There is someone with a green icon above their head and I realize it's probably a newer player like me. Now at this point, I have been playing for over an hour. I would have expected to have encountered some PvP, some crafting, some city management, some something related to the major marketing points for playing Glory Victus but so far just mindless PvE and fetch quests. Why design those deep systems if your early game has nothing to do with them? So, to ensure that I wasn't mistaken, I retrace my steps to Steam and its website to double check. This becomes revealing. On Steam, their description is as follows. Glory Victus is a MMORPG with an emphasis on realism set in a low fantasy medieval open world. So far, so good. The next part is where it begins to fall apart. Enjoy MMO. Yes, it didn't say enjoy this MMO, just enjoy MMO. Regardless, enjoy MMO with skill-based non-target combat, open PvP with territory control, deep crafting system, and player-driven economy. Well, the combat was non-target, but it took next to no skill to kill anything within the first hour. The game also didn't put me into any PvP scenarios at all, nor teach me how to control territory. I was also tricked twice, thinking that I was going to get a crafting tutorial, but nope, just fetch quests, and at no point was I introduced to the player-driven economy. The last phrase is, all that served with beautiful graphics and immersive atmosphere. Okay, that's mostly true, but here's the problem. The first list of descriptions are primarily meaningful if the second set is experienced. For you philosophers still listening, it's a conditional syllogism, but the problem is that in my first hour of play, I had no PvP, not even a hint of territory control. And when I thought the game would finally give me a crafting tutorial, it was just a fetch quest. Remember earlier when I said that there are minor corner cutting problems with the game, yet the core is functional and enjoyable? That principle applies here, even in their description. I believe that later in the game, these features are likely fun. It must be so, because they've had a loyal player base for years, and the trailer show dozens of combatants engaging in siege warfare, but as a newbie, expecting to engage in those systems. Since they advertised them to me, I'm quite frankly very confused, because my entire time has been fraught with fighting the UI and completing fetch quests or kill quests for NPCs despite thoroughly enjoying the world building and the gripping soundtrack. There's a massive disconnect between the earliest experiential stages of the game and the developer's vision for it, which is illustrated by an infographic found on Steam. Too bad the vast majority of it finds no expression within the first hour of gameplay. I scroll down the Steam page, hoping to be proven wrong, yet my concerns are further realized. In the About This Game section, there is a large banner that says, The Army Needs You. Great, I'd love to be a part of it, but nowhere in the first hour of gameplay did you invite me. In the next paragraph, Gloria Victus is compared to Mountain Blade and Planetside 2. Well, maybe that's conceptually accurate, and again, that's the problem. There is enough here that this association is reasonable, but in execution, neither of those games' influences are meaningful within the first hour of gameplay. In Mountain Blade, within the first 60 minutes, you're already conquering settlements and managing an army. Within the first hour of Planetside 2, you're already engaging in massive sieges with hundreds of other players. Here? No. You're listening to a guy quip about the weather while being told to push E to gather the resource, which is actually a tent you're setting on fire. Oh, and my presumption about tents and bells being resources were confirmed when I examined the achievements on Steam. I had already gathered 59 items, despite never harvesting a single resource. So all those tents and bushes must have counted. That explains why the resource language kept being used. Another corner cut. But the achievements are more revealing. Since most players make a decision to keep playing a game within the first two hours, a reason why Steam gives gamers two hours for a full refund, I'm curious to see how many Gloria Victus players stick around. Well, only half gather more than 100 resources, and since those are also quest items, only half of players went a little further than me. Less than 20% had a full hunger gauge, which means that 83% of players did not play long enough to have to feed their characters again even less earned the login for a week straight reward. So churn rate and retention is struggling. 
That's unfortunate, and I think that these numbers would drastically improve if the early game experience matched the advertisement. Maybe that's why players quit if your game doesn't do what you said it would do. So, is Gloria Victus fun? After more than an hour of playing, new players are not introduced to the major features advertised by the game, and that's a shame. It's also clear that most Steam players do not play for much longer than I have based on the achievement data. However, if you're able to look past some cut corners, disassociated world building, and irrelevant lore in the early game, perhaps you may be able to dip your toes into the features that have resulted in positive scores on Steam. I certainly enjoyed the atmosphere, the soundtrack, and the melee combat, although at nearly every point I saw a woman in a red dress. The Lazy Peon's recent video suggested that between level 20 and 40, Realm vs. Realm, City Management, and Expansive Crafting opens up, and his opinion on the newbie experience was generally more favorable than mine. Either way, it's gonna be die. are you wanting to vicariously enjoy a MMO through video instead of playing one? I've been there too. To satiate your thirst, here's more MMORPG content just for you. Thanks for watching.